I'm gonna make this complete turkey dinner in six minutes. Oh, well, use... hang on, hang on. A, a whole turkey dinner? I'm happy that tech is like, you know, really important for yeah. working at home, schooling from home, staying connected with those you can't be uh, with physically. It just shouldn't be that in our great country that individuals have to make use of food banks. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Lennox. With the season of giving fast approaching and a global pandemic in full swing, the holiday season is bound to look different this year, likely much smaller. On today's show, how to safely celebrate the holidays with your loved ones. And later, the hottest gifts this season, plus recipes, strategies, and tips for a different, more low-key kind of holiday feast. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. It's beginning to look a lot like a COVID Christmas. In a new survey, one in three Canadians say they'll be cutting back on things like travel, dining out, and alcohol this season. 57% say they've taken to shopping via the web, while only 53% say they'll shop in-store, down from 69% last year. Meanwhile, 6 out of 10 Canadians plan to reduce the size of their holiday gatherings, while a quarter intend to cancel their plans. But even though this season doesn't look exactly as it usually does, it's also an opportunity to leave the well-trodden pathways of tradition in favor of new alternatives. Now, Dr. Thomas, Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, has said that Canadians should think twice about celebrating with people outside their household. For many, this will be pretty difficult, right? The holidays, they conjure up these notions of families gathered together, sharing a meal around the table, and that will look kind of different this year. So what are the challenges people are going to face um, when coming to grips with that reality? Well, um, I guess the, the main thing is loss, right? That, that with change comes loss. And we, are, we hearken back to the way Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever we're celebrating is supposed to be. And somehow it feels like the COVID Grinch is still in Christmas this year. <laughs> Right. But with so so we have to acknowledge that this is hard is not everyone. Also, we have to also acknowledge people who live alone, maybe in a different city from their families and they are isolated. And isolation is something that before this pandemic was already very problematic in our society and this coronavirus and all of the lockdowns that you know we've had to go through has exacerbated this problem and so it is hard we have to just acknowledge it's hard and then there's something else that we humans are really good at it's adapting so i think the first thing is just coming to grips with what is the reality of this human beings are connection creatures we are attachment creatures and when we don't have our attachments nothing works well you mentioned the need to be connected, and you also mentioned loneliness and how um, horrible that can be. I, what advice do you have? How do, how do you cope without family during the holidays uh, if, if, you, if you can't get together because you're, con you're concerned about safety? So this is where, when we come into the reality of what it is and what we need, it, and it's about our creativity because Human beings are endlessly creative and it's not ideal, but we have, we have this technology, we have telephone technology, and we may have ways in which there's certain traditions we can share together in an interesting and new way. You know, Mark, she mentioned some meaningful alternatives for people to stay connected during the holiday season. What will you be doing? Sure. Well, obviously technology can help as she touched on. Uh, so just first personally, we'll, 
you know, my parents are in our bubble, so we'll spend time with them, even though I'm trying to resist the hugging and kissing, just to err on the side of caution. That's tough. But That's yeah, tough. Exactly. It is hard. Uh, so for some friends, we'll do driveway visits, as we have been over the past few months. Even in the colder temps, we're going to do that and drop off gifts and things like that. But uh, for our, the rest of our family over the Hanukkah season, we'll be uh, video calling, you know, and thankfully, there's no shortage of ways to connect virtually with people. So though all, we may be physically uh, apart, we can still emotionally stay connected thanks to technology with video chatting, which is a lot more, I think, a lot more meaningful and engaging than, you know, a regular phone call. I would think so. All right, when we come back, how to make the most of a holiday Zoom. That's next. <laughs> It's this one desk lamp that I have right next to me. Now, if I turn it off, I'll go from something like this to something like this. Welcome back. Zoom gatherings will never fully match the intimacy of in-person ones, but they can help keep families connected and maybe even preserve some traditions. Here's Zed News' Sean Stante on how to set up the best Zoom view for the holidays. Oh, well... Gone are the days of revealing your unmentionables this holiday season with Zoom calls and loved ones because today I'm joined with Zoomer Media's tech guru, Ken Grunberg, who's going to show us some of the do's and don'ts of video calls this holiday season. Ken, how are you? Hey, Sean. Um, I'm not sure about those pajamas, though. I don't think it's going to go over well. Nobody wants to see that. First pro tip. First pro tip. Okay. Duly noted, I'm going to go change. Okay, and now that I'm more appropriately dressed for a holiday conversation, Ken, walk me through what some of the next steps should be. Well, one of the things you have to remember that these cameras that are in the tablets, uh, in the computers, and the laptops, they're all automatic. They don't really allow you to change any of the settings. Some of the things that we're going to talk about here is just the way to get some of that control back. You know, looking at your picture right now, uh, I can tell that it's really low. It's, on, it's probably sitting on a table in front of you, and it's looking up at you. You know, one of the first things you should do is consider your framing. It's much better to be on eye level, and likewise, so the camera should be on eye level. So I think the first thing you should do is prop up the iPad or the tablet or whatever you may be using. You can get clever. All right, what do you think of that? We're all propped up, now you're not looking right up my nostrils? <laughs> yeah, no, it's looking a lot better. I mean, one of the things I noticed right away as you did lift it up, I see that there's a lot of light behind you. You actually look a little bit underlit, so I think what I would do in this particular case, it seems unusual. In an effort to make you look better, we're actually gonna turn off some lights. Those pot lights behind you, and I think there's a light in the corner, it's probably best if you just turn them all off and let's just see what it looks like then. Okay, so I've turned off all the lights. I think you have the right idea, but looking at it now, I don't think it's working really as, as we thought it would. Earlier I did see a, a, what I think was a Christmas tree peeking to your left. Maybe just shift the camera that direction instead of having a window behind you. Let's have a nice Christmas tree. I think the framing is a lot better. I think the issue that we're still having now that you have something bright again in the background, which is the tree itself and the lights. The way we can offset that is if you have something nearby, like some sort of a lamp, I think if you just set that up on the dinner table right next to you, it might actually provide the light that's needed to kind of bring your exposure to the right level again. Okay, well, it certainly looks better. One of the things worth mentioning as you left the frame, as I didn't see you, uh, people would notice that the camera automatically adjusted for the fact that you weren't in it. Because I think it has a lot to do with the colors that you're wearing. Now, I know you're really fond of your Z News Blazer, but why don't we do an experiment? Because right now the image looks a little washed out. And my suspicion is that the camera's trying to expose 
for the dark color. You see? Ah, Just like that. It actually it did. much better. Much of what we did with you is actually what I've done here. But the main source that's actually providing all the light is just this one desk lamp that I have right next to me. Now, if I turn it off, I'll go from something like this to something like this. So Ken, these have been great tips for a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I've got my wonderful mother over here. Ken, meet Julie. Julie, meet Ken, our tech guru. Hi, Hi Ken. Julie. And we'd really be interested in finding out how to properly frame for our conversations with family members overseas or out of town. I think in your case, all you gotta do is move the camera a little bit over to your left. Uh, and I think with the tree in the middle, you'll have a really nice shot. Okay, how does that look? Yeah, I think it looks great. By bringing the camera a little bit back, which you had to do, you also showed the nice dinnerware, so now you can see a little bit of what uh, you're eating as well. Is there anything that you're curious about when it comes to Zoom calls? Absolutely. So Ken, you know we're a large Italian family, but we're going to be very reduced this Christmas. But we still have a happy knack of talking over one another. What should we do to minimize that this Christmas? And the microphones are automatic. They try to make the best sense of what they're hearing. If you have two people talking, it doesn't really know who to focus on. I think it's best to just kind of be considered when it comes to people on the other end hearing things clearly. Great. Awesome. Works See? For me. We just did it. We're talking over each other right now. <laughs> Couldn't even hold it back. Well, thank you, Ken Grunberg, our tech guru, for sharing these pro Zoom tips with us that I'm sure are going to up our video call game this holiday. I can't wait. And with that said, now let's make some festive Zoom calls. Huzzah! Oh, wow! <laughs> <laughs> and remember, if you guys at home would like to watch more episodes of The Zoomer like this one, visit thezoomertv.com. Thanks, Sean and Ken, for that. Now, when we come back, tips and recipes for a scaled-down holiday menu. That's next. I'm going to make this complete turkey dinner in six minutes. <laughs> Welcome back. That was Moshe Hammer on the violin and David Warwick on the piano. 60% of Canadians plan to reduce the size of their holiday gatherings due to recent spikes in COVID-19 cases. With fewer mouths to feed and even fewer hands to help, many of us are wondering how to downsize our holiday feast, plus looking for some easy-to-make alternatives. Celebrity chef Bob Bloomer joins me now with how to whip up a quick and easy holiday dinner. Bob, great to see you. Fantastic to see you, Marissa. What are we cooking today? Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Well, I'm going to make you a complete turkey dinner. But, you know, first of all, we don't have a lot of family coming. And, I mean, we, the collective we. And so you want to scale things down, but you want to maintain some kind of tradition. So I'm going to use... Well, hang on, hang on. A, a whole turkey dinner? We have all of maybe 10 minutes for this segment. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm talking about a turkey dinner with a turkey tender... Uh, cranberry sauce made from scratch and green beans with hazelnuts and a brown butter. And I'm going to make all of it. Well, how long would it take you to make a dinner like that? My cooking skills are horrendous, so maybe an entire day, but uh, realistically, a a an hour or two? Well, what would you say if I told you I could make it in the 10 minutes that we have allotted? I wouldn't believe you. Could uh, you do I'll it? I'll go one better. How about eight <laughs> minutes? Come on. No. How are you going to do that? Well, you know, I want to leave some time to talk about my fabulous new cookbook, Flavor Bomb. So I'm going to make this complete turkey dinner in six minutes. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, let's start I'm the gonna... clock. <laughs> All right. Here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Count me in. Three, and... two, one. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So the very first thing I'm going to do, because it's going to take the most time, is I'm going to make the cranberry sauce. All right. So I'm going to take about a cup and a half of fresh cranberries. Yeah. I'm adding a half a cup of orange juice. Now I did preheat my pans. That's the only thing I've done. So half a cup of orange juice. 
third a cup of brown sugar. I happen to have a cinnamon stick. I have a cinnamon stick here, so I'm just gonna use, throw half that in. If I didn't have a cinnamon Ooh. stick, you could easily just add a few uh, sprinkles of cinnamon. And lastly, uh, a little bit of Grand Marnier. Very important Grand now. Marnier. Want to crank the heat up and put a lid on it. In five minutes, we're gonna have a fantastic fresh cranberry sauce. Okay, next up, the turkey. This is a turkey tender. Turkey tenders are like chicken tenders, except they're a lot bigger. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the most tender part of the turkey. So I'm gonna cut it crosswise, about a quarter inch thick. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna toss it in a little bit of flour. And the flour is gonna help it brown. And at the same time, um, it's gonna give us the base for a quick and easy pan gravy. So a little bit of butter in the pan. Just crank that up a bit. And I'm gonna add just a splash of oil so the butter doesn't burn. And now I'm taking my, uh, my little turkey cutlets. By the way, this we're is at looking good. Oh my gosh, we're at four minutes already. Four Help. minutes, 23 seconds. Holy smokes, that <laughs> is my wife. And I forgot to salt and pepper these, so chef. I'm gonna do it after the fact. It's my sous chef and my camera person. Okay, <laughs> lastly, green beans. Okay, so we're gonna take a little bit of butter in the pan. I've, uh, I've got some green beans, beautiful fresh green beans. Mm. We always need our fresh veggies. Now I've got some hazelnuts here and I wanna smash these up. And I'm adding them to the pan. And though this recipe isn't in my new book, Flavor Bomb, all the same principles apply. So it's about creating maximum amounts of flavor with a minimal amount of work. And it's, it's based on all the tricks and tips and hacks and techniques that I've learned from eating my way around the globe for the last 30 years. All right. And I've learned, from, I've learned from all sorts of people from uh, hawker stall vendors in Singapore to uh, gumbo champions to fancy French, stuff, you know, Michelin star French chefs. And along the way, I've just picked up so many different tricks and hacks and ways to shortcuts to add huge amounts of flavor and layers of flavor and texture. So look at this now. See, we've got very quickly, this turkey is cooking. How much time do I have left on the clock? Less than three minutes. So gone are All the right. days of the giant turkey that you shove in the oven for several hours. Well, you don't need it. And you know, truthfully, this is, we've got all the same traditional flavors. And um, at the same time, you know, you don't have to spend all this extra time. Maybe you're only cooking for one or two people. And so it's like having your turkey and eating it too, so to speak, yeah. if, I, if I may. Is this Sorry. what you I guys know. will who be doing this? this? Who writes this material? That's what you <laughs> want to know, right? Okay, so, so now we're going to make a quick pan gravy. This is all, already cooked all the way through. So uh, I'm just going to take a plate, get this out of the pan. And uh, I'm adding a little bit of Marsala wine, or you could use sherry. Woo! Well, you know, you got to be a little careful when you do that. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of chicken stock. If you didn't have chicken stock, you could add some water. And I'm just going to put a little more flour in here to thicken this up. Turn it off a little more chicken stock. A little more flour. Looks like a good consistency. Yep, and we're done with the green beans. We are done with the pan gravy. How are we for time? Oh, one minute. Oh my gosh, we got plenty of time left. Let's just take a look at those. Look at those beautiful cranberries, the way they've broken down. Okay, so good. we're gonna set this up. We're gonna plate it. I'm gonna do that right here. Start with my lovely green beans. Have one more step for these in a second. Final minute. Whoa, there's no time to spare here. <laughs> okay, my turkey cutlets. Are you gonna take a bite? 
Well, it's a little hot. I don't know if I want to. There we go. Look at that beautiful pan gravy. And lastly, our from scratch cranberry sauce. And because I have an extra couple of seconds, I'm going to take my zester and I'm going to do a little bit of fresh lemon zest on those beautiful green beans. That looks beautiful. And there you go. Start to finish. There you go. In six minutes. Okay. And again, I've used all the same principles for my book Flavor Bomb. And it's really, it's about cooking with, like everybody in your audience uses the same ingredients that I do. But I've learned how to up the ante and basically make everything that you cook taste better. With a tiny kitchen like this, and, um, and again, the same ingredients, but it's the techniques and the tricks that you apply to all those common ingredients that you're already using that allows you to create bigger, bolder, more interesting flavors. So tell me, about, that, tell me about Flavor Bomb. Give me your two, three, three favorite recipes from Flavor Bomb. Uh, well, this recipe on the cover, that's uh, Carbonara. Um, it's actually one of the simplest ways to make Carbonara. There's no cream, there's no wine in the sauce. It's basically egg yolks and Parmesan cheese, but they create that along with the starchy pasta water, another great hack, um, creates this beautiful, luscious, rich um, carbonara sauce mm. that just, um, you know, it coats the pasta so beautifully. Um, you know, I have, I have one recipe that's uh, kind of perfect for the holidays. It's, um, it's a potato lodka that I form in a waffle maker and then I deep, after I do that, I deep fry it. So you get the beautiful, crispy crunchiness of a potato lodka um, topped with a smear of sour cream and some luscious, glorious smoked salmon and then a poached egg and even a little bit of salmon roe on top. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. That sounds great. Of course, well, I wrote the book, but... Well, let me ask, how, how are you guys going to celebrate the holidays this year? Is it just going to be the two of you, or...? Yeah, you know, it's just going to be my wife and I, and um, I think one nice thing to do, if it is just one or two or three of you, however many, is is um, just change it up a little bit. You know, you don't have to make the fanciest the fancy dinners, but make something that you don't make during the year that's not one of your traditional go-to Wednesday night dinners. So that, that alone just makes it a little bit special. And... Um, Candles, nice bottle of wine. Who even remembers there's a pandemic happening? You got it made. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Happy holidays. Uh, it's a pleasure. Back <laughs> at you. Look forward to being in your studio next time. Next time. This time next year. Definitely. All right. <laughs> Up next, Mark Saltzman with his 2020 Holiday Gadget Gift Guide. Stay tuned. Uh, and people do want to buy gifts uh, for their kids and grandkids, and there's no shortage of great gadgets in 2020. Welcome back. That was David Warwick on the piano and Moshe Hammer on the violin playing God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. This holiday season might look a little different for many, but one thing that won't change is finding the perfect gift for your loved ones. Mark Saltzman joins me now with some of this year's best tech gifts. Mark, Hi. thanks for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, tech's always hot, right? But I think this year, some of this stuff is better than ever. Yeah, let's face it. Nobody can anticipate what happened. Um, and I guess selfishly in my industry, I'm happy that tech is like, you know, really important for yeah. working at home, 
schooling from home, staying connected with those you can't be uh, with physically. Uh, and people do want to buy gifts uh, for their kids and grandkids. And there's no shortage of great gadgets in 2020. That's for sure. So yeah. walk us through what you have. All here. right, where to start? How about a smart display? So mm -hmm. uh, many Canadians have a smart speaker. They're as low as $30, where you, you know, ask a question and you get a human-like voice giving you an answer. With a display, you have the added benefit of something visual. So uh, similarly, you can ask a question, control your smart home devices and all that. So for as low as $99, the Nest Hub is a great device. This one is the Nest Hub Max, a little bit larger for $239. But you can say something like, OK, Google, show me eggnog recipes. Recipes so found. not only are you going to hear your Google Assistant give you a you know verbal instruction step by step, but you'll also see photos and videos and you start the cooking process and it walks you through it and it asks you verbally, okay, tell me when you're ready for the next step. Or you can set a timer for yeah. something in the oven uh, as with, uh, with Bob with your previous segment. Or if you dare, you can say, okay, Google, how many calories are in a cup of eggnog? <laughs> <laughs> There are 223 calories. Okay, well, there you yeah, go. there you go. Uh, with the Nest Hub Max, not only is it a larger screen yep. compared to the Nest Hub and bigger sound for streaming maybe Christmas music or whatever, that, but you also get a camera built in. So you can make free calls with up to 12 people over oh. Google Duo. So free video calls as well. So that's, a, I think, a great little gift uh, for yourself or a loved one this holiday yeah, season. Yeah, I like yeah. that a lot. And you mm -hmm. said it's, what's the price of this one again? So it's 239 for the larger <laughs> one, but $99 for the Nest Hub, which, which doesn't have the camera. Okay. Yeah. And a little bit of a smaller screen. A smaller s screen and a smaller speaker. Got but it. same idea, there's a microphone that's l listening for your command. Got At it. your beck and call, if you will. All right, next up, and speaking of uh, camera, uh, again, computers super hot this year, and web cameras that you may want to externally connect to a computer. This has both, of course, built in. Uh, this is the latest Surface uh, Laptop, d uh, excuse me, Surface Laptop Go from Microsoft. And it is a uh, feature-packed laptop without breaking the bank. Something like this would typically go for about 1500 but it's yeah. $759 to start. It's got a 12.4-inch touchscreen, the HD web camera for Skyping with your friends and family or your coworkers, a very comfortable keyboard and trackpad, uh, and a battery that lasts up to 13 hours. So, a touchscreen, yeah. so you can... Yeah, so you can use your fingertip uh, to, to play, you know, to swipe through photos or yeah. to play a game, but, uh, or, and use the physical keyboard if you're looking to get some work done. My existing laptop yeah. that costs more than that doesn't yeah. have a touchscreen, yeah, so that's, that's right. neat. Yeah, so this is, a, you know, so Surface is uh, from Microsoft. It's their own brand and super slender and light as well. Um, so, yeah, $7.59 to start for the Surface Laptop Go. And I think that's a good gift. And while it may not be the best gift to, you know, to give a kid, I don't know, a, a, any child would be excited about a router. <laughs> but uh, from a practical standpoint, take advantage of the sales this time of year on your Wi-Fi because with all of these devices connected to the Internet, and we'll, we'll get to a couple more in a moment, it could bog down your wireless network. Uh, so the latest standards is called Wi-Fi 6. And this is um, from D-Link, and this is uh, called the AX1800 Wi-Fi 6 router. So it's the latest standard that's up to 90% faster than the last generation of Wi-Fi, and perhaps more importantly, it can support more simulta simultaneous devices on the network at the same time, so yeah. Does it extend the network at all? It can do that as well. This is actually a mesh router as well. So you can add these little pucks into other parts of the house if you if you like, if you have a larger home, yeah. and it makes that wireless handshake back to the router. That's optional, uh, but uh, this does support it if you like. Yeah, so again, it's called Wi-Fi 6 uh, router from D-Link. Um, what else? Um, Fitbits uh, and smartwatches, very yes, popular. Very popular right yeah, now. Yeah, so this is the Fitbit Sense. It's uh, on sale through Best Buy. Uh, it is a smartwatch, it's very versatile. Of course, it calculates all your steps and your calories burned and, and all that. Uh, it's got sleep detection, but it also has a lot of uh, health related features built in. So, like what? So, it has an ECG, an electrocardiogram, yeah. so you can uh, get some heart health information. It has uh, stress management features like a skin temperature sensor. Mm -hmm. Uh, that can also detect your, uh, you know, what's going on in your body and, and communicate that to you, either, either on the watch itself or th with a companion, like a smartphone nearby. It uh, also has, uh, as I mentioned, sleep uh, monitoring as well. If you're mm -hmm. not getting a great night's sleep, and not many of us are these days, it can, you can share that information with your physician. Uh, it can be used with either Google or Amazon Alexa, so you can use your, your voice of choice, the, your voice assistant of choice, and again, it's on sale right now.
right now for three fifty nine instead of four twenty nine. So it lets okay. you do more, you know, without having to reach for your phone all the time. It show you texts and emails. And, and all, all this that. stuff you can purchase online too. Yeah, yeah, of course, to have it delivery. Except, except don't wait till the very last minute because nobody wants to get a. Christmas gift in January, but uh, yeah. I think everybody's ready. All the couriers are ready and all that. I would think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> VR, also very popular. Video games across the board are popular, but this takes it to the next level. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people think that when it comes to VR, it's something that maybe younger generations are into, yeah. but there's a surprising group of older adults that are really into VR, in part because yeah. of loneliness and combating some of those That's things. That's exactly it. And it's not just about video games, which I know a lot of the Zoomers are playing games, uh, but it's also about things like virtual escapes. Yeah. You can download um, free virtual vacations, which you may be not doing in real life, uh, <laughs> so you might as well have a virtual getaway. This is, by the way, the Oculus Quest 2. And what I like about it is not only is it lighter and uh, less expensive and smaller than its predecessor, but you don't need to connect anything to it. Like some VR systems you have to plug into a computer oh. or into a game system, or you have to put a phone in the front not with this how do you uh, load so it? you just it joins your Wi-Fi going back to the router and you just download content you see like a store it's if you haven't ever if you have never tried VR it's it's a, a really it's so immersive and all-encompassing and it's tied to your head tracking so you imagine seeing a giant online store with your fingertips uh, or with a controller it does have a camera that looks at your fingers you can actually tap to download something and it stores it in the VR headset and it's user-friendly because I think a lot of yeah. people might think oh I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to manage, yeah. figure this out. It, it is very user friendly, yeah. surprisingly. And if not, uh, if you don't, if you struggle with it a little bit at the beginning, maybe you have a more tech savvy family member who can help you out. What's the price so it's one? $3.99 to start. And a lot of the games are free, which is really nice. The, the previous generation was $4.99. So I like how Facebook, who owns Oculus, has gone down that route. Okay. And then finally, something more science than tech is, I think, a more sentimental gift this time of year. It's uh, the Ancestry DNA kit, uh, which is also on sale. This, these are one of those um, kits where you provide a small saliva sample, send it away, and you get back this ethnicity estimate where you can see where your family's from, going back hundreds of years on these color-coded and interactive maps. There's over a 1,000 regions around the world that are supported. And you can um, connect with relatives, you know, flesh out your family tree, see migration patterns. It's really neat, and it gets better over time. But it doesn't give you any health information. That would be no, a separate... That's correct. So Ancestry DNA is all about, you know, the genealogy and about your family history um, but uh, yeah are there other services that provide that because you know I think and the best thing about ancestry DNA is it's fairly inexpensive right yeah that's right it's usually 129 throughout the year but this time this time of year it's 69 which but, is fantastic you know when you typically when you do when you look into your genes and, yes. and that sort of thing I mean that'll run it you used to be thousands, thousands of dollars, of dollars. yeah exactly. now exactly. 69 bucks which is awesome well, there you go. and you get it back really quickly and it gets better over time I did it about five years ago and it gets more and more accurate the more people do it so it's really okay. fun when I get that ping in my inbox and I uh, check out what's new, maybe a, th a third cousin that I didn't know about. So, <laughs> yeah, there you stuff. go, yeah. there you go. All right, Mark, thanks so much for bringing all these gifts in. My pleasure, thanks okay. for having me. When we come back, how food banks are preparing for the holiday season. That's next. <laughs> There has been a 200% increase in the number of people accessing food banks uh, since the pandemic started. Welcome back. That was Moshe Hammer on the violin and David Warwick on the piano playing Jingle Bells. The holidays are adding to the pressure that food banks are already facing because of COVID-19 with fewer volunteers and donations. Daily Bread Food Bank CEO Neil Hetherington joins me now to discuss their plans for the holiday season. Neil, great to see you. Thanks very much for having me. First, let me ask you about your annual Who's Hungry report. It predicts that 2020 will have the highest number of food bank visits ever recorded in Toronto. So tell us a little bit about the findings from that report. There has been a 200% increase in the number of people accessing food banks 
uh, since the pandemic started. That's on top of a 5% uh, increase that we saw year over year before the pandemic. And when you think about that, things were good. Um, we ought not to have had an experience prior to the pandemic where food bank usage was increasing um, while the economy was so good. And that speaks to uh, some of the challenges uh, in the cost of living in the, in the city. So the pandemic happened and, uh, and now we are seeing just dramatic numbers. And it, just, you know, we received our November uh, numbers yesterday. We saw 110,000 client visits uh, in November alone, just in the city of Toronto. And by comparison, last year, the highest month that we ever saw was around 65,000. So a dramatic increase, uh, and um, uh, we are uh, completely dependent on making sure that the community knows about that, gets involved about it, not only in terms of food and funds, but also in terms of advocating for systemic changes. Now, early in the pandemic, food banks really struggled to stay open, right? Because there were declining volunteers and declining donations. How did you guys manage to keep your doors open? Well, we have a firm commitment to the community. We said that our goal is that no matter what the volume is of clients who need food banks, we will meet that need uh, and we will do it in a safe way. So what we did was uh, when food banks needed to close down in the city, some of them run by volunteers, uh, some of them in higher risk groups, uh, we set up pop-up food banks. And so that meant that many of the libraries in the city of Toronto suddenly became uh, food banks. Uh, it meant that we partnered with AMJ Campbell to make sure that our deliveries could be uh, could be made. So whatever it took, we uh, we reached and jumped over that hurdle. And there were many additional precautions and operational pivots that we had to do. Um, and I'm very proud of the uh, the volunteers and the staff here who uh, who have made sure that our promise has been kept. Now you recently announced that you're canceling the holiday food drive. So why'd you make that call? Well, what we decided, uh, regrettably, to do was not necessarily cancel the holiday food drive, but cancel any anything that was considered in person. So because we are in a gray stage uh, in the city of Toronto, uh, we were going to have a contactless drive through where people and families could drop off food. And we just thought, um, you know, at worst, that could have been an area where people were leaving their home uh, it, who were non-essential workers uh, and, and congregating, uh, even if it was a contactless uh, scenario. And that, uh, you know, we just were very concerned about the perception of gathering people. But here's the thing. Uh, there is still ample opportunity to donate food or funds. We are hopeful that people will help us reach our 400,000 pound goal of food and they can drop that off at any fire hall. Uh, and we would make sure that it uh, gets sorted and sent out to families experiencing poverty quickly. So then what are your plans for the holiday season? Our plans are very similar to, to what we've been doing month in and month out, making sure that the food goes out to individuals who, uh, who are experiencing poverty. At the same time though, I, let it, I want to make it very clear that we are doing all we can through the research that you've already cited, the Who's Hungry report and recommendations for government. We're going to be continuing to advocate for some systemic change. It just shouldn't be that in our great country that individuals have to make use of food banks. And so we want to tackle some of those issues in terms of affordable housing, uh, in terms of income security, in terms of precarious employment, some of those deep uh, systemic social policy challenges that we know are out there. We're going to tackle those and we are going to make a positive difference in our community. How are you going about tackling those? Well, we're, we're doing research on those, those issues, and then we're laying out clear recommendations for all three levels of government. And then I guess the third thing that we're doing is, you know, an interview like this, where I'm hopeful that every single one of the viewers will stop for a second, maybe read the Who's Hungry report, uh, and call their elected official. And just say, you know, when we build back, let's make sure that we build back smart. And that means that we are making sure that the divide between those who have and those who do not is lessened. Let's make sure that people have access to decent, affordable housing. Let's make sure that the Canada that we live in is the Canada, the values that, that we espouse. And, uh, and that may, means that, uh, that everybody gets to the chance to live with hope and with dignity. Well, there's no better way to celebrate 
the holidays than by giving back. So how can people support Daily Bread or their local food bank? Well, we're very hopeful that individuals would uh, consider supporting us either through making a, a financial donation to dailybread.ca or any of the local food banks across the country. Um, we are also hopeful that you'll consider dropping off food. Um, and then the third thing, there's a whole host of people watching who don't have that capacity right now to be able to, to make those contributions. And we completely understand. And so my hope is that they will uh, be the ones that are advocating alongside us to make sure that nobody's right to food is ever uh, compromised and that it's realized right across the country. Neil, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Take care. There's more after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Zoomer. Once again, please welcome David Warwick and Moshe Hammer. That's all the time we have. Thank you to David Warwick and Moshe Hammer and to my guests. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Holidays, everyone. For now, it's time to zoom out.